Hey, if y'all have your Bible with you, we're in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and then we'll be going to John chapter 8, verse 1. I want to go back to um, uh, I want to go back and re put uh, uh, a new emphasis on Romans chapter 8, verse 1, because I feel like that is so important. Um, a lot of Christianity is, is feel stuff and emotionally driven. And God always uh, works through the understanding. Truth sets you free. Truth understood sets you free. And for us as Christians, the mind is the battlefield. Um, as far as us, our salvation is concerned, that's secured in Christ. But our mind is the battlefield. And the enemy that we cannot see, uh, Satan, and which you and I in this room have probably never met Satan. He can be one place at one time, but he's got thousands of demons. Uh, and they have the power of suggestion. They don't have any power to make you do anything. They just have the power to suggest stuff directly to your mind. And then on top of that, now they've got TV, internet, billboards, whatever, to aid them in, in their stuff. And so, you know, when we talk about victory, how to have the victorious Christian life, I really feel like it starts at a certain place that if, if you don't have this, you're not going to be very effective and I want to talk about these four things quickly tonight. So if y'all have a question or something, feel free to ask. So um, um, let me just clarify. There is a huge, uh, there shouldn't be, but there can be a huge difference between being saved and knowing, having the assurance that you're saved. Okay? And I don't know if you've ever doubted your salvation. It's a, it's a horrible spiritual condition. We'll let the ladies get through here. Um, but if you're not settled on knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where you're going when, you're die, when you die, you, your life is just not going to succeed anywhere else. That is the most important. And yeah, there's a lot of people, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of people today that don't care. I mean, they don't care where they're going. Obviously, they're not doing anything about it. But for me and you, we know. So I want to emphasize, put some emphasis on Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And I want to remind you that in Romans 7, we looked at two or three lessons. We looked at a man who's having a tremendous struggle. He wants to do right, and he messes up and does wrong. And the things he don't want to do, he ends up doing. And you all know that struggle, okay? Y'all know it. Now, but, but here's something that you must understand, and this is why I'm starting right here. He's not struggling with sin. He's not struggling with temptation. He's struggling with the law. Okay? Because uh, Paul, for example, the law, he thought if he kept it, he'd go to heaven. But he realized he was a sinner. And when he realized that he was a sinner, the law that he thought was going to get him there condemned him. Okay? And now, this, this favorite thing of Paul, man, if I just keep the Ten Commandments, I'll go to heaven. Now he's finding that it's against him. It's going against him. And he's finding that the law is condemning him instead of helping him. And thank God he got to that point in Romans seven twenty four, and he cried out, Oh, wretched man that I am, I need help. 
who's going to save me? Who's going to save me? The law is now not my friend, but my enemy. And so he's just really in a bad predicament. And he finds in Romans 7, 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he accepted, in verse 25, he accepted the struggle and understood it. With my mind, I'm going to serve the law of God, but I realize I'm not a perfect man. He's not making excuses, okay? He actually wants help. Now, I, I want to start uh, with these two symbols right here. And, well, I tell you what, let me read verse 1 in chapter 8, and before these will make sense. Chapter 8, verse 1. So, therefore, there is now, at this present time, no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Now, that is so important, okay? Because if I took you tonight and I brought you before God the Father as your judge... And God the Father asked you a question, and He said, uh, You've broken my law. Is there anybody in here that hasn't? I mean, would you look at God and say, Well, no, I don't think I have. Anybody? Okay. So, so by, by saying, <laughs> you all just pu publicly confessed, you've broken God's law. So could God justly condemn you, put you in a lake of fire? He could, couldn't he? Because we've broken his law. Now, maybe you could say to God, maybe you would say to God, but God, and I know this is going to sound stupid, and I'm glad it's going to sound stupid because it sounds stupid, and the, to say it makes you stupid, and not to see it makes you more stupid. Whatever I just said is this. So are you going to go before God and say, well, God, I, I know I broke your law, but my neighbor goes to church. And they profess to be this. But God, I, I will tell you something. I was not as bad as my neighbor. So does this sound stupid? See? <laughs> but people say it all the time. They say it right here to convince themselves how good they are. Now you tell God that. And, and God's going to say, I'll tell you what, let's just act like it's just me and you. <laughs> and nobody else is alive. So, so we're all in agreement that nobody can get to heaven by being good. Right? So the law... I'm using this word since Paul said there's no condemnation. The law condemns. Now, if you notice, I drew two of these for a purpose. It's hard enough to have God's law because it's perfect. Add on top of that man's laws. And I'm not talking about laws like speed limits. I'm talking about rules and regulations that men impose that churches put upon people and they bind and condemn them. In, that? Their, in their days, Jesus broke their law. He did. Yeah. Eating on the Sabbath, on and on and on. Of course, Let's, let's do some of these because it ties into this. Because these rules condemn us. And I put Satan and a condemner here. Okay, I want to show you what I'm doing. Satan is known in the Bible as the accuser of the brethren. So here you are, you're standing before God and... Here comes Satan as an accuser. Yes, God, I, I saw them do this, this, and this, and this. And he has. And so the devil wants you and me to live our lives in guilt. 
never feeling free, never feeling saved, never just always messing up. He wants us to walk with our heads down. He wants to always point the finger at our bad stuff. And the devil is an accuser of the brethren. Did you know the Greek word for the word slander? Slander. Slander. Yeah, that's not really pretty, but... The Greek word for slander is a word that's used for Satan. And Satan is a slanderer, which means an accuser, a gossip. To gossip to somebody about somebody else's faults makes us more like Satan than just about anything else. Um, the desire to see somebody else fall and fail makes us more like Satan than anything else. So Satan is always there to accuse us. You know, you go, you're not worthy to pray. You're not worthy to take communion. And on and on and on. It never ends. And then you've got the laws of men. You know, how, how do you think, let me just throw out an example. I just want to throw out an example. There are 10,000. But how do you think uh, this woman who's never been in church and she's invited to church and she doesn't have a dress but she has pants on and the preacher sees that and he gets up and preaches against pants for women. Oh, you're dressing like a man. How do you think she's going to feel? Right. Because John 3.16, we all know. Does anybody know John 3.17? God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And so that preacher, instead of winning her to the Lord by preaching the gospel, he condemns her. Oh, if I'll just preach and make her feel bad, maybe she'll get saved. But you could go on and on and on. There are preachers who condemn me if I don't use their Bible. Where do you want to stop? Where do you want to stop? There are preachers who condemn me because I would baptize somebody in a baptistry. Instead of a creek. I mean, where, do, where does it stop? I'm saying it's hard enough for God's law, but I wonder how many people have been ran away from Je run away from Jesus because of men's stupid laws. Hmm? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so you've got the condemner. You've got the Pharisee. You've got the man or the woman who is so spiritual in their own eyes and all they do is sit on their little throne and judge everybody else and condemn everybody else. And I'm going to show you how that plays out in just a, just a second. And, and so I'm tying this in for a reason because there are so many Christians who uh, haven't enjoyed life and, and experienced victory because we can't be good enough. We're always bad. You know us Christian people, we're, we're, we're never say the things, we're, we're always, y'all know what I'm trying to say, I'm just trying to tell you, this is exactly where the enemy wants to keep the church with her head down in defeatism. Because we mess up all the time. How many of you pray as much as you should? How many of you read your Bible as much as you should? How many of you go to church as much as you should? How many of you, work, where's, it, where's it in? You see what I'm saying? And so there's, there's no ending place. Now, <clears throat> the apostle here said there's no condemnation. Let me tell you what that means simply in a biblical sense. And I'm just going to be straight honest with you. This is not my opinion. I'm so glad God gave us a book with words. Because words have definitions. And you can't change the definition. Okay? So um, there are preachers who hate the word predestination. I'm not going to teach on predestination. 
but it's a word and it has a meaning. And if you give its meaning, wow, you've opened up. Woo, big stuff. So don't be afraid of words. So the word condemnation means this. It means you're going to hell and the lake of fire if you die unsaved. It doesn't mean God said, ah, shame, shame. It means you stand before God at the great white throne and He sends you to the lake of fire because you broke His law. But the Apostle Paul found in verse, actually back up in verse 25, but uh, in Christ, he says, there is no condemnation to them that are who? In Christ. I can't, you all, I know I'm telling y'all stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to hurry here because I want to get to the essence of it. So, let me, make a, let me make a bold statement. Jar you just a little bit. What if I told you, <clears throat> how many of you would say, that for me to be a good Christian, I don't need men's laws. I got one thumb up. And I got this little fellow in the blue shirt, y'all. He raised his hand. Anybody? So y'all want all the laws and traditions of man that are nonsense, that are not biblically? Y'all want those? I mean, won't we be all better Christians? <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> whew, that was old English right there. Questions. So so we don't need this. Can I erase it? Yes. Okay, I can erase it. Y'all are confident now. I mean, you sure? Okay. All right. So I don't need that to be a successful Christian, right? Okay. What about this one? Do I need this to be a successful Christian? No, all you need is cross. Huh? Got a head nodding yes, and Cody says no. Ooh, and the rest of you are undecided. <laughs> shame, shame. Come on, you can't sit on the middle of the fence. Why halt you between two opinions? Huh? If you have Christ and He's working in you, you're going to follow God's laws naturally by walking in the Spirit. Oh, so I don't need the stone. Okay. All right. Because well, the stone's supposed to be wrote heart? on your heart anyway. What? It's supposed to be wrote in your heart anyway. Mmm. It's supposed to be in my heart. So. The law also shows us that we have to have Christ. Okay. So the law is not for a Christian. Well, and then it goes back to what she says. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but they are there. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Those remind yeah. us. Huh? Those remind us. Help us remember. So. so if I put the little stone Ten Commandments like in my pocket every day and get them out and say, here's how I become a good, strong Christian. What, what, what's going to happen? I'm going to fail. And I'm never going to feel like I'm doing any good, right? Because the law condemns good. So, hallelujah, I could do whatever I want now. Y'all are killing me. I'm like, d d d no. What, what did God do to replace the law. Oh, you all said <laughs> well the blood was the fulfillment of the law and we the Ten Commandments are not to be black out of my body. Oh right, right, right. Because God wrote them on the stone, and if God put them on the stone, He, he meant for them, He meant for His people to obey those. Love thy neighbor. But I can't, Dad. I can't. 
Right. The, the law is good. You're so right. It's me, Mess. But we obey them, but we go on and we serve Christ because he is a high priest. I agree. I agree. You're, you're right. He's done away with all that. Ain't no more you, no sacrificing of animals or shedding of their blood or nothing. Christ shed his blood for that reason. That, amen. Set us free. You all are so right, but you're so wrong. No, no. I'm, 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 no, that's not the word that I was going to use, Dad. Okay, you're so right, but you're so you're so revealing why the enemy has kept us from full victory. Let me tell you why. Let's read verse 2. Who makes us free? No. Romans 8, 2. Read the whole verse. Who precedes Jesus? Yes. The third person of the Trinity. You see, what Jesus did is executed through the Spirit. And what the devil has done is he has convinced us that once we are saved, that's all we need. Once you're in Christ, you are f saved. No more condemnation. But here's the problem the apostle's having. He is finding himself, okay, I know I'm saved. I know my faith is in Christ. I know his blood. I know it all. I know it all. But I'm not finding the power to be the Christian that I want to be in life. Do you understand? I mean, am I making any sense? And so the answer is in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is... Miss, Miss Robin made a statement that under the old covenant, you have law on stone. In the new covenant, it's the law written on your hearts. And so we have something better... Oh, glory, hallelujah, I don't need two stone tablets in my pocket. I have the Spirit in my life. And stone doesn't hug me, hold me up. It condemns me. But here's the beauty. When we're led by the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is controlling us, the law becomes a delight. There is no greater joy than knowing you did what God wanted you to do and it was right. Well, we, we've not always had the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was on, on earth, Jesus was the light of the world. Right. And He couldn't always be here on the earth. He ascended to His Father. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? Yes. God sent His Holy Spirit as a comforter Amen. to His people. Yes. So we have that spirit in which we don't we don't have the law, I mean to obey, mm -hmm. to be a Christian and, and go to heaven. We have the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit as a comforter to us Christians to let us know that we know God and God's gonna take care of us. That's right. That's right, Dad. That's right. And, and it, this is so wonderful because, and I wasn't picking on you all when you all kept going to the cross, to the cross, to the cross. But that's what the enemy, when I was, a, when I was a, you know, saved at 14 years old, I, I didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. I knew Jesus, and that's all. That's the Holy Spirit. He's like behind the scenes, and He brings us to Christ. But I want you to really get Romans 8, 2. It's not Christ in this verse. It's not Christ who, who sets us free from the law of sin and death. It's the Holy Spirit. See, let's, Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin... The Spirit 
saves us from the power of sin. Remember, notice the word in verse 2. Do you all remember the illustration that I used that uh, when I drop this, there's a law you can't see? And that, yeah, you can't touch it or feel it, but it's there, and you want to watch it, then watch this fall. Okay? It'll fall unless, unless I stick my hand out and, and intervene, then I keep it from hitting the floor. Now, so the law of sin and death is in us. It pulls us down. It makes us say bad things, think bad thoughts, make bad decisions. The law of sin and death is here. Come on. We can't hide from it. We can't run from it. It's me. It's me. It's not my neighbor. It's me. Okay? How many of you know that law and you feel it, right? Well, so what God did is He put a greater law in you. The Spirit of God is greater than anything else. And so it is simply this. If I yield to the Spirit, He... Oh, my goodness. I just, I just want to take a second and, you know, can I tell y'all something? I'm going to tell y'all something real quick. Um, let me just try to put it this way. <laughs> so I told you all that I was in Christ at 14 years old and grew up in a Baptist church and Jesus was preached and hallelujah. Because when I realized I was lost, I ran to Christ. And by the way, the thing that kept me lost was not how my sin. I was a church boy and I was like the, the Apostle Paul. I did this. I was a good boy. You know, I went to church and tried to, but I realized I wasn't a good boy. God showed me that I was a sinner. And he showed me by the, um, the um, I don't know which commandment it is, but God slew me by one of his commandments. Okay? God slew me by one of his commandments. When I thought I was a good boy, I had never in my, you know, I'll just say this real quick. And because um, I, I didn't grow up in a household where my parents used uh, curse words. And... So I knew, the, I knew the, the dreadful, dreadful, dreadful curse word was to use God's name in vain. And that was like blasphemy in my house. And one day I was 13 years old and I got mad at somebody. I was so mad at this person. I was, and I'm not a hot tempered, but when I had gotten to that point and I, I, I wish that, I don't want to give you what that word means. But if you put the two words together and you say it to a person, I use God's name in vain to that person. And as soon as that come out of my mouth, it's like lightning struck in the Holy Spirit. It's like time stopped and there was nobody and the Holy Spirit right there said, did you hear what came out of your mouth? And, and I was scared. I was lost. And now I was a sinner and the Holy Spirit was all over me and he said, that's because your heart is corrupt. That's because you're a sinner, Bobby. You're not the good boy you thought you were. You're not, you're not the, the law. Body. And so God used the law to slay me, kill me, literally kill me. And, um, and it wasn't the law that he used to save me, as you all know. It was, thank God, my mom and daddy brought me up under the preaching of the gospel. And that's why I stand as long as God will give me breath from my pulpit. I'm just going to say, parents, what in God's name? And I, I wish there was 10 millions listening to me online. What in God's name are you thinking not to get your kids under the sound of the gospel? Because when they wake up by the spirit that they're lost, they may turn to anything to try to drown out that, that reality. They may go to false religion. If they've never heard the true gospel, they'll run to anything, any cult, 
just to find some something. So anyhow, so I was saved at 14, and, and I, I wasted my whole teenage life. You know, I've shared this with you guys. I wasted my teenage life because it, it wasn't that I was just a bad guy and really didn't. I really got saved, and I had the assurance of my salvation, but I wasted it because I couldn't do it. Man, I couldn't do it. I tried, tried to read my Bible. I struggled. Str my, my, my life was just struggle. One word, struggle, as a teenager. And so in 1983, I was saved in 78. In 1983, uh, I got to Romans 7, 24, and I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Nobody, my, my church, I love my church. They gave me Jesus, okay? They gave me Jesus. But you, sh you pull out a Heavenly Highway hymn book. You pull out a Baptist hymnal. You pull out thousands of sermons through the ages, and you show me how many make hardly a reference to the Holy Spirit. And that's why when you all said, you said it innocently, you said it purely, but nobody a minute ago, when I said what replaced the law, nobody said spirit. It's because we've not been taught that. And so you got thousands of Christians that have finally just threw in the towel and accepted, well, this is how I'll be. One day I'll be in heaven and I'll be a lot better. No! You can be a dynamic person. You can win people to Jesus. You can make a difference in your life, on your job, wherever you are. Don't waste your Christian life on the mentality, well, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but I'll just have all these struggles and all of this stuff. No! We don't have to do that. Amen? And so this is, this is, and so in 1983, when I was sick and tired of being sick and tired and I threw my hands up to God, something happened in my upstairs room. And I will just tell you this, I don't know what happened. I do now, now that I learned some Bible afterwards. But all I know is that I was a teenager, 19 years old, and tears were flowing from my eyes. And God, I'm wasting my life. I don't even really know if I'm saved. I don't even feel saved. And, and, and God, I'm just a mess, and I'm tired of coming home and, and just feeling this guilt. And I don't know what happened, but I will tell you this. When I get up off my knees in that house on 210 New Salem Road, I will just tell you this. The very next day, I had super crazy cravings for the Bible. When I read my Bible, truth started going wild. I couldn't, I couldn't write it down fast as I was seeing it. I had this crazy, I would fall asleep if I prayed. I would fall asleep, you know, saying my little prayer. I'm on my knees. I'm praying for my cousins. I'm praying for my guys I went to school with. I, I'm burdened. I, I have a fervency in, in my prayer that was never there. And it, and it was just, um, I went back to Houchins the next day. I didn't care if everybody went to hell, and I went to Houchins, and the first guy come in the door, I don't know if he was a Pepsi vendor or bread vendor, first guy, never, it's never happened in my Christian life, God said, witness to him. The Holy Spirit was like all over me. See, the Spirit and the bride will say, Jesus, when you're led by the Spirit, you want to see other people saved. That's just the way it goes. And so here I am. Everybody quit coming down my aisle. It's about, after about five days, they were all coming down the, the middle aisle, which was narrow. My aisle was the big one because I was just like, you're going to hear about Jesus. And that's, just, that's just the beginning. And next thing I know, you know, I'm at Core Hill on a Wednesday night and doing a, a lesson, and I, I was like a wind come and got me, and I just took off. What am I saying? I'm saying I told you how bad and weak and pitiful I was. But I realize that you and I, are we're, jar, we're jars of clay. But it's who's in us. It's the Spirit of God taking the ordinary, making us extraordinary. It's the Spirit of God. BJ, I just looked at BJ, and I'm not picking on BJ, but in the book of Acts, when God said, choose seven men to lead the church, the first thing he said is pick out seven men that are visibly uh, recognizable, men full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said to the church, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for mission work. The Holy Spirit, you know, on Pentecost, so I could go on and on and on. But I want you to understand, here's, here's, in closing. Before you close, I got something to read. Okay, Dad. You may have put your law on that. Matthew 5, uh, verse 13. Matthew 5, verse 13. 
17. Mm -hmm. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For be I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Okay. Who fulfilled it? Jesus. Right. We can't. He did. I know, but you don't want us to take it out. <laughs> I came not to destroy. That's, that's yeah, you know what? Spirit, though. Yeah. This, yeah. When the spirit is in you, it brings the law with it, and it is written in your heart. Yeah, and along with what she's saying, Dad, think of, think of this. Think of this. When we're walking in the spirit, we fulfill the law. See, that's that's what I'm trying to say. Is is we've got too much preaching that preaches to self and says it, it, it he, instead of preaching people to the spirit who is my enabler they they want me to do it I can't do it you see what I'm saying but you're right I, I mean there's no disagreement there dad I mean Jesus came to fulfill the law but just remember this just remember this let's just like we preach the gospel to get saved by instead of the law. So we preach the Spirit to live out that salvation rather than the law. Does that make sense, you all? It's, it's, you know what you, you know, the, here's what you have. You have two persons. And so this makes my Christian life about two people that I can talk to and know and have a relationship with. I can't talk to a stone. Does that make sense, you all? It's it's so vital. Let me say this: You know, a lot of people when they get saved, uh, they've been a lawbreaker. They will tell you that. Yeah. And God has took that all away from them. They yes. no longer break the law. Yes. You're right. And they give their heart to the Lord, and, and, and they're a different person. Mm -hmm. Become a new preacher. They Amen. That. Amen. That's good. I want to close. Can I close? I want you to go quickly to John 8, and I want to close right here. And I want to demonstrate, just in reading, what happens in real life of what I've talked about tonight. I want to tell you all, as you're turning there to John chapter 8, I'm going to make a statement. And I'm going to tell you the greatest danger um, facing the church today is not homosexuality or Democrats. or whatever other sin you want to come up with. You know the greatest danger that's always faced the church and is still facing the church today is when a bunch of humble people who on bended knee come to Jesus as sinners and got saved. But somewhere along the line, those humble people turned into Pharisees. And those humble people who were sinners headed for hell now are really, really holy and spiritual and way up here, and all the other people are down here. And we become, I don't even want to say it. I don't even want to say it, Aaron. Worshippers of the law. We become this. The condemner. You know what we become? Can I read just a familiar, familiar story to you real quick? Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. When they set her in the midst, they said to Jesus, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. You can't argue with that. If God said it, 
You can't argue with it. And he said it. That was his law. Oh, and by the way, he also said the man too. See, that's what your condemners do. They pick and choose what they don't do. But condemn. Do you, am I making sense? Am I making sense? Let me tell you, if you, want, if you want to eat crow, just say, I'd never do that. Yeah, come on. Judge not. That's exactly right. It'll come back and get you, won't it? Don't, let's, let's don't become condemners. It's easy. It's easy to do. It's easy to look down on people that you don't think is as good and spiritual as you. But it's going to be a rude awakening because nobody in this room or outside of this room is the measuring stick. Jesus is the measuring stick. And God is not going to say, God's not going to look at Dusty at the judgment and hold him up and compare him with Tony. We're all compared to Jesus. So we all fall short of his glory. Okay? So you can't argue with the law. And they said, tempting Jesus, that they might have to accuse him. <laughs> Not her. They had every right to accuse her. They were trying to accuse our Lord. You see how the devil is? You see how this spirit get on you? It'll make you nasty. It'll make you mean. It'll make you arrogant. It'll put you on an ego trip. And you run away unsafe people so much because they don't talk like us and dress like us and act like us and, and we become, no. I have never in my whole ministry, I got to be quiet. I got to stop somewhere. I'll tell you, for I've been preaching since 1987. I've been pastoring since 1988. And I'm, I, may, I may sound like I'm mad, but I'm not. I'm not. It's, it's water under the bridge. But the, the person that's given me more sleepless nights in ministry than any other person is the Pharisee, who is the most spiritual in the church. They run the church. Da 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 da. -da. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Pharisees, mean. You don't even feel comfortable around them because they got this spirit that these guys have. I don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground. You all know the rest of the story. And the line that I want to read is in verse 11. There were no accusers, according to verse 10. Has no man what church condemned you? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You all, when y'all do something, will y'all do me a favor? Will you, do, will you do me a favor this week? Will you start tonight? I want to ask you to do something maybe you've never done. And I want to ask you to do something that you've never done. Start doing it a lot more. Have a conversation with the Holy Spirit. Talk to Him. He's God. He hears. He's real sensitive, Helen. He's like a dove. He can be grieved. He can be hurt, quenched. But he's, as Dad used a word, let me just remind you, when you're going through that, excuse me, but I'm sorry, but I feel like I'm okay. When you go through that hell on earth, when you go through that valley, 
when you walk into that funeral home and your heart, you know who it is that gives you peace? Yeah. It's the Holy Spirit. I don't know how he does it, Patsy. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he does it. I don't want to know. I don't have to know. I just know he's there. He's good, ain't he? Aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit? Let's get to know him, praise him a little more, and have a conversation with him. That's good teaching tonight. Not that I did it, but just the word's good. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad I got y'all corrected on a lot of stuff. <laughs> I mean, I've had to work hard on Russell and Brenda, but I've, I've got it. I've got, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I need this. I need this. I need to be reminded. Okay. All right, y'all, let's go move some mountains. Get up. You can't do it sitting down. No, I love you guys so much that y'all would come and sit and spend time together with me and the Word, but we need it. We need the Word. Man doesn't live by Word alone, but what? Yeah, that's right. Good job, man. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah.